Welcome to our supply and demand Pro Trader series. This video is a very good place to start if you want to learn the science of supply and demand. This is lesson one. Would you like to know when and how big banks and institutions buy and sell? Like Goldman Sachs, for example, or maybe Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway? Would it help you if I could show you what this looks like in a real world case study? Awesome. So let's go over a little case study I prepared. Sharpen your pencils. This lesson will help you with the understanding of supply and demand and will form the foundation on which the rest of the series is built on. Hey there, if we haven't met yet, I'm Bern. I'm a full-time trader with 10 years of experience. I manage $2.4 million in prop from capital and lead a licensed investment consultancy based in Dubai. We specialize in providing real trading education and the best part, I get to travel the world while trading. How do I do it? Well, I rely on my two-step mechanical process, but enough about me, let's dive right into the slides. Okay, we want to make money. Now you've learned by low sell high. On this chart, without question, what is the absolute best place on this chart we could have bought this stock? The bottom. Very simple right there. Now, what do we know about that spot with absolute certainty? We know that there are more buyers than sellers, more money, and that's the thing, more money was coming into the stock at this point in time than was going out. In other words, more buying than selling. Well, if more money is what's driving the stock and driving it up, then that's the place where we wanted to buy and we also want to know who is moving the money around. Because if we understand who is moving the money around, that could give us an edge, an advantage, putting odds in our favor. So let's look at all the money in the stock market. In the US stock market, there's $44 trillion currently in the market and it is controlled by two principal groups. You have the average Joe, that would be you and me. If you open an account and manage your own money, you would be considered a retail trader or retail investor. And on the other side, you have your institutional investors. These are, for instance, your hedge funds, pension funds, insurance companies, and the big banks. Now, of the two, who do you think is controlling the most money? Well, by far institutions. In fact, on a volume basis, 90 plus percent is traded by institutions. That means only 10% retail investors and traders. So if we know that money moving into the stock can drive the stock up, if more money is going in than going out, what we basically now understand and can establish is that who is moving the money? Institutions. So back at that spot, we could say with absolute confidence, it wasn't just money coming in, it was institutional money coming in. They're the ones that basically are moving the price because they have the money. You and me, we couldn't move a stock even if we tried to. Nobody cares what we are doing. But here's where our advantage lies. We can move in and out of investments and trades incredibly efficiently, very, very, very fast. So let's look at this piece of evidence, an article by CNBC about Warren Buffett that explains why he bought 10.7 billion US dollars of IBM stock. This article is from November 2011, and in short, it tells that Warren Buffett has been buying IBM shares worth 10.7 billion US dollars since March 2011 and continued doing so. By the way, Warren Buffett has more than 114 billion US dollars. He's an institution unto himself, 114 billion. If he takes a small percentage of his portfolio, let's say 10 billion, they are moving not a little bit of money, but a lot of money. And even when they use a small portion of their portfolio, it's still an insane amount of money. So let's go back to the chart and find the area where Warren Buffett started buying. Because this chart is actually the price chart of IBM. Warren Buffett started to buy in March. So the area we spotted is actually the area where Warren Buffett started to buy IBM stocks. So let's go back in time. Let's assume it's March 2011. There are a few questions Warren Buffett must answer first before he can buy IBM shares worth 10.7 billion US dollars. What are these questions? How many shares can he buy? Well, that's easy math. Buying $10.7 billion worth of IBM shares with an average price of roughly 
$160 at this point of time, he can buy 67 million shares of IBM. Now another question is, is that a little or a lot of money going into that stock? Can he buy all 67 million shares of IBM in one day? Well, based on the average daily volume that is traded on IBM, which is roughly 6 million shares per day, the answer is pretty obvious. It's a lot of money and based up on the laws of supply and demand, if he were to place an order for 67 million shares all in one day to buy that stock, what would happen to the price of that stock based upon the laws of supply and demand? It would skyrocket, not just a little, a lot. He would get a few million shares filled, and then this stock would end up rocketing up $300, $400 a share before he got the rest of his orders filled. Now, if he ends up buying his shares on the way to the top, a majority of the shares he will buy at a much higher price. Is this good or bad for Warren Buffett? It's bad because his average share price would be much higher, absurdly high. So will he ever act that way? Will he ever just put one order in? No. Out of his own self-preservation and desires to make good returns, what will he have to do? How could he get that 67 million shares filled and not disrupt the price as much as possible? Scaling in, ladies and gentlemen. He will scale in a little at a time. Can institutions buy everything they want to buy all at one moment in time? Yes or no? Based on what we have just discovered, clearly no. So, so they have to buy a little here, then a little later, and then again a little later. Are you following that thought process? This is very important to understand. But on the other hand, can you buy all at one time? <laughs> yes. And that's where your advantage is. I'm going to show you how we can use this advantage to really take advantage of this here. So what have we established? Institutions control the price of our stocks. They drive them up, they drive them down. Why? They have all the money. You and me, we can't move the price of this stuff. Uh, of this stuff. But we have got to make money from the stocks. If we buy a stock, we need it to go up. But who can drive it up? Only they can. Who controls the market? Institutions. Can institutions buy all at once? No, they must scale in over time and require multiple transactions. Can we buy all at once? Absolutely. We are very, 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 very fast in the marketplace. Although nobody cares what we are doing. Man, we are really quick in the marketplace. Imagine this. You want to make some extra money, so you decide to play tennis professionally. The catch? You've never played before. But that won't stop you. You dive into the world of tennis, reading every book and watching countless YouTube videos. After all the preparation, you enter your first tournament, Wimbledon. And guess who is waiting for you on the other side of the net? The legendary Roger Federer. Now, be honest, are you going to win? Probably not. You might get lucky and score a point or two, but let's face it, you're going to get your clock cleaned. Why is this important? Well, it's a lot like how people approach the financial market. They jump in, hoping to make some extra money, but here's the rub. They're going up against professional institutions. These guys are serious. They know the game inside out and they're in it for the long haul. So no matter how many books you read or videos you watch, you're just setting yourself up to get your clock cleaned again. So if you want to compete effectively, you need to rethink your strategy. It's not enough to just prepare. You need to go out there and play, learn from your mistakes and adapt. Otherwise, you'll always be on the losing side of the net. Now, what I'm trying to teach you to do, I'm trying to teach you to get into a tournament. But instead of being opposite Roger Federer, I'm teaching you to get on the same side of the net as Roger Federer. Play a little double with Roger. And once you play a little double with Roger, all you need to do is get out of the way. Let him run the court for you and you will make more money more often. Are you clear about the game, game plan here? Yes or no? Bottom line, if institutions are buying, you better be what? Buying. If institutions are selling, you better be what? Selling. 
doing the same thing that they are doing and how do you know where they are buying and how do you know where they are selling. There are footprints that they are leaving indicating what it is that they are doing. Would you like to learn those footprints? Let me know in the comments. I was just watching Shark Week the other week and you know what? We are just like that fish attaching itself to the bottom of the shark. We are the remora. Yeah, that's what it's called. It's literally attached to the bottom of the shark. Crazy, right? I hope this video helped you grasp the basic concept of supply and demand. Get ready to dive into the next lesson of my supply and demand pro trader series. Stay tuned for more exciting content. See you next time on my channel. Wishing you happy and safe 7 forget trading.